for the lateness of that. Um, but I think we have all of the board members in and that are in attendance tonight. Hey, uh, one more. I don't have I don't have uh, audio on mine. You, you can't hear. We're getting one more. Can you hear me? Good chair. Yes, but uh, we can hear you. So, Cease, were we supposed to be back on the agenda for today? Jerry. <laughs> Aurelia sent out an agenda this afternoon. For the board meeting, not for the budget committee, right? Uh, I, I, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I didn't see one for the budget committee. I didn't either. Me see, Aurelius. Basically, and I'll let you know. I the issue tonight is update after the um, economic forecast, mostly. So, right. Yeah. And this is Jennifer. If everybody could, that that is not because Cease is going to start with uh, Representative Nierman. If everybody else could go on mute for us, please, while so we don't get a lot of kickback. Um, as we do this. And for those of you that are live, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is Jennifer Kvist. I'm the superintendent. We are about to start our budget meeting in our new platform uh, here in our own district office. So uh, please bear with us as we work through some, uh, we work through some technical difficulties and getting everybody on board uh, in this new process. I want to first say we thank Western Oregon for allowing us to uh, be in their venue, but um, really have moved back and are building our own uh, platform so we can have a little bit more conversations in our meetings. So um, just bear with us. This is what I call Central School District Virtual 1.0. Uh, there are some other things that we're working through um, as we continue to get better at this. So just um, this is our first one together. So uh, bear with us, but um, we believe this will allow for a little bit more robust conversation amongst us, both for the budget committee meeting as well as the board meeting. So Thanks all for being here this evening. Thank you, Jennifer. So uh, with that uh, virtual gavel, uh, we will reconvene the uh, may, uh, meeting that we opened on May 18th of 2020 uh, for the uh, Central School District Budget Committee. Let's start with a flag salute. So um, I don't know if, I don't, I don't see a flag there. I don't have one, but uh, if there's one in the room there, that would be fine, so, okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, individual, ind indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thanks everybody. And then uh, I'll turn that, uh, I guess we need to have roll call here. Um, Cease, can I delegate that to you or, or Jennifer? I don't I don't have a list of all the members, so. Um, I, yes, I'll, I'll be glad to. Aurelia yes, doesn't have microphones, so good. I will um, do that. And the uh, board members, Steve Love. Here. And Peggy Klein. Here. Don Wall. Here. Darcy Kirk. Here. Jan Job. Vidal Pena. Here. And Jerry Schinkel. And if, if you all couldn't hear Jerry through the microphone, he is here. So I will uh, let you know that you can do that. Nope. That didn't work, Chair. Um, so our budget chair, Representative Mike Nierman. Here. Uh, and let's see, who else do we have? <laughs> Tom Perry. And Richard is with us. 
uh, Rachel Dabercow and Mary Schellenbarger is excused. All right. So that is all we have for roll call, Chairman. Thanks. I'll, I'll turn it back over to you for the you and to Jennifer to the for the update. So um, as we convened our meeting the last time, we were a couple of days ahead of a release of the economic forecast by the state uh, Oregon Office of Economic Advisors. That uh, was released on Wednesday, May 20th. Right after that, the Oregon Department of Education and all of our professional associations, um, including the Superintendents Association, my Business Officials Association, started working with Oregon Department of Education to try to determine what the economic picture might be for um, the various funds in the that that make up school funding. Um, based on that, we were able uh, to get some guidance about what potential cuts might look like. As a reminder, uh, these cuts currently the governor has made an across the board. Um, cut directive to agencies, which includes the Department of Education and includes their oversight over the state school fund. And that's really all we still have to go on at this point. Um, however, we we know what those what another sort of across the board cut might look like based on various sources of funding. And then we don't know still what might happen um, if the legislature convenes and they have the only ability to uh, rebalance funds to determine, for example, the uses of state reserve funds of the education stabilization fund. There are a variety of levers that could still be pulled um, in order to increase funding. So what we wanted to do tonight, just briefly with the budget committee, is let you know, um, again, a reminder of the, the only budget that's been prepared so far, and the one that we presented on May 18th, is a budget that presumes full funding. It, it still continues to presume that the original budget that we were working off of in February is there. And we made a few adjustments to expenditures, um, but basically pretty much rolled things up that things were fairly flat in those assumptions. Um, what we have for you this evening is some what the cuts would look like for us. And um, you were sent out a document and hopefully folks got a chance to look at that. Um, Lisa, I have the ability to share so I can share that publicly. Absolutely. That would be great. So Jen will bring that up on the screen so you'll be able to follow along there as well. Um, and what this document does is offer suggestions of the kinds of cuts that we could make um, to to meet the again what we're currently hearing as potential impacts from the um, our, our professional associations working with the Oregon Department of Education and those, uh, I've divided it out here by sort of basically different funding funds that we get through state income tax, state lottery tax, uh, or state lottery proceeds. And then again, uh, the corporate activities tax, some of which actually was slated to go into the, 
to the general fund for the state school fund and some of which had its own separate account um, which was to be sent out to us as the student investment account. So at the top of this um, document, I, I listed the general fund and there are really two line items of revenue in the general fund that come directly from the state. And one of them is the state school fund, but the other is a pass through through the Willamette ESD. So you see SSF is the first one. And then the second area would be our line item, which is the Willamette ESD. They get a portion of the state school fund that they then pass through to us. Um, part of it we buy services with, and then part of it we just pass through to be able to um, cover costs in our general fund. That would also take a bit of an impact. So I've listed that separately. Um, what the appropriation amount we were um, allocated on February 25th is $28,080,000, 80331 So on the far right, and some of you might have to sort of reduce your little pictures if you have pictures of all of us over there. Um, what we were given as a target reduction to that would actually amount to reduction in our state school fund of $1,324,600 or so. So we took that $1.3 million deduction if that were to come through. And I think uh, we've talked about the values and priorities that we would like to maintain. We are working to keep our workforce whole, um, hoping to keep our employees in their jobs. So our goal is to not cut staff. Our second priority is to keep students whole. And by that, we mean to not impact their instructional days, particularly after the spring term that we've been through, um, knowing that students need every bit of instruction they can get, we, we have hoped to find savings elsewhere. And we've been pretty fortunate in that over the last few years, um, not only have we had some contingencies and reserves built up, but we've also been able to set aside quite a bit of money to make other kinds of, of investments of time. Um, and those are extra hours potentially or extra days that our staff might get, but they are not part of their regularly scheduled pay. So we looked at those kinds of things first, along with vacancy savings, the kinds of um, openings that we've had that we have not yet filled where we've put a freeze on hiring. And so some of those are listed here. So uh, for those of you, some of this is a little jargony, so I'm, I'll um, go through that. For example, the first thing that's listed is team engagement. And what that is, is a some, some money that we have set aside to be able to um, pay extra to our faculty and staff to be able to um, assist with coordinating district-wide activities, um, building teams, for example, um, getting folks together to support students in the positive behavior intervention supports, um, to be able to uh, manage uh, initiatives that come up and things like that. <coughs> Cease, let me add it. Let me add yes. in as well. This is Jennifer. Part of that team engagement gives principals the autonomy to when they feel it's necessary to pull different teams together, that they have the ability to do that. And so that money is really focused on that work that may not be able to be uh, done during the workday, but could be done 
as he says, an extra hours, an hour here after school or in the morning or potentially even extra days before school starts or as school ends. So really focusing on both that as we talk about the development of the whole child academically, socially, emotionally, and behaviorally. And so uh, principals having the autonomy because you want your leadership. And as we continue to talk about, um, you know, voice in our, in, as we develop good teaching and learning um, and our programming, that's, that's really what that uh, money is specifically uh, targeted for. Yes, thank you. That's a better explanation. <laughs> uh, so there is some money set aside in that. And basically what I've done here is sort of use that as a way to um, reduce our, our budget in, in an impact that would definitely impact us, but potentially available to reduce that. And the odd dollars are because I'm trying to balance the <coughs> $615 I have to budget. So enrichment, um, this was designed as a, a way for us to supplement learning, particularly uh, in, in connection with a grant we have. It's called the 21st Century Grant. Uh, it is federal money for after school programming. And so after and before school programming. <clears throat> so the 21st century grant is uh, covers m much of our needs, but we had actually budgeted money in the general fund to be able to um, give additional supports there because perhaps the uncertainty of our delivery of after school programming in the future, depending on whether or not um, we have students back and what kind of groups and um, things we can gather them in. We looked at that and saw that that additional support uh, would potentially be a place to save money in the general fund. We still have the 21st century grant. Uh, we may have to um, monitor those that grant money and, and determine impact on programming. But this was a line item for, again, extra pay for current staff or hiring um, additional support staff to bring in for those programs. Doesn't get rid of after school programming, it, but it could impact it. We have money set aside for PD, professional development. Again, those could be extra days before or um, before the school year starts or at the end of the school year. It just could be extra hours here and there after a regularly scheduled work day. And that is also, there are some specific days set aside for professional development uh, that could require extra pay. I didn't, we did not put that as a line item. Um, we could add that if the budget picture looks worse. But at this point, we were able to budget the balance, budget, balance the budget reduction without that. Again, all, all of these are speculative numbers, uh, but there is some more money there that we could use towards the savings. Right now, all of that professional development is left intact in what would be our next version of the budget. <clears throat> a lot of things we look at, we, we often look to travel first as a way to cut. And um, in order to, to address the, the last, the current budget iteration, the only one that we've presented to you, we have already reduced travel. So that, that line item had already been affected. Um, we left some travel in there and uh, again, that's pretty important to our professional development efforts. There could be further reductions, but it had already taken a hit. And the same thing with contingencies. The budget that you saw actually did away with the curriculum contingency and in fact had um, lowered a capital um, repairs contingency. Uh, to a smaller percentage. So those have already both been reduced, but more work could be done there if we need to. 
This next section is called Moved to Student Investment Account. And again, the student investment account, which is the um, significant investment that was made from money generated by the corporate activities tax. We went through a big strategic planning process, a community engagement process, got lots of input about the kinds of services and supports for students uh, that that money could be used for. We have been told, and, and that actual fund is on the next page, but we have been told that there could be some money in there next year. Um, so we are, we, we are looking at how to best use that money, but there are three line items that were pretty important to us because they were funded in the general fund in 2019-20, the current budget year. They were funded, intended to be one-time expenses. The intent was to add capacity in these areas and move those positions or services to the student investment account. We want to honor that uh, to try and keep continuity there. So these three line items include two uh, TOSAs, which stands for Teacher on Special Assignment. Those were um, hired specifically to help two of our elementary schools uh, deal with behavior issues with students, freeing up classroom teachers and um, our mental health counselors and our principals to focus on other issues. So those two positions currently are on staff. We want to preserve those, but in order to make the $1.3 million cut, we are moving those to the student investment account. And same thing with a teacher on special assignment in English as a second language. So a specialist that was hired by one of our elementary schools um, to work with classroom teachers and with students. Um, we've seen some great results there. We want to make sure and fund that position, con continue current services, but that had always been intended to move to the student investment account. And the last move we would propose there, um, we have always had Polk County Mental Health Associates in our schools. And last year, knowing we had some one-time money that we would be able to move to the student investment account, uh, we actually hired additional or contracted for, these are not our employees, we contracted for additional mental health counselors from Polk County Mental Health at the secondary level. So we went from a half one half time person to cover both the middle school and high school to two full time mental health counselors. Um, again, that's been critical in the past, but we see there will be greater need for that. We want to preserve those positions and um, have removed those from the general fund. And the next few things are vacant positions. These are positions that are not currently filled. Um, they are things we would have to figure out how to do without. Um, for example, the after school coordinators, we, we had one in each elementary school. Um, we would retain one. The class size reduction instructional assistance, those are positions that we have funded for the last few years, but we don't always fill. Um, they are a way to help um, increase the adult ratio in classrooms if we have particularly large enrollment at certain levels. And um, we, we uh, our board secretary left us during this year. Uh, she, and that is also serves as the assistant to the superintendent. Um, we're not sure how we're going to do without that position, but that's one that the superintendent has asked us to consider um, defunding in order to, to meet our savings goal. And we had a cabinet level director, our director of teaching and learning. Um, that is another position we would propose not to fill 
if we have to make these funding cuts. Again, um, that leaves two licensed administrators at the district office level to handle all of the student support and teaching and learning. And one of them is your superintendent, who's also supposed to be doing other things. But that position does obviously yield savings uh, that we can put towards maintaining student instructional days and jobs. Uh, we had one more position and we've frozen it, uh, but I'm not putting any savings from that position because we may have to fill that job as we move on, depending on student those cuts and that uh, those dollars include uh, salary plus APR, which is associated payroll costs. So that includes taxes and benefits. Those savings listed there could save us the $1.324 million that we potentially will need um, based on how the budget process moves forward at the state level. So are there questions about those positions? And again, I would ask for those that may not have used Zoom before, you have a panel at the bottom. If you click on the participants, you can see a hand raised and then we will um, take those uh, from, from that list. Know why, but I can't use my cursor to mute myself. No. If that's your whole screen is covering up my ability. So, to... I don't know that I'm following the rules, but I have a question. <laughs> Go ahead, Don. Um, so just a uh, clarification. Uh, I didn't see any percentages on here. What the amount that you're taking out is based on what level of uh, guidance? Uh, that's a great question. And I was trying to get that, but um, I can't get back to my screen to pull up that for you for some reason. So 4, 4. Guess, 4. Just, I'm going to stop sharing for a second to see if that helps Cease here. So just give us a second and then I'll pull it back up. Well, I guess the last thing Last time we talked about uh, an eight and a half percent cut and the fact that that was equivalent to a 17% cut for the second half of the biennium. I'm just trying to get a sense of what we're aiming at here. Yeah, that is 4.7% cut and that is all of the cuts that would be taken in the second year of the biennium. So where does that come from? I mean, where's that 4.7% come from? That is the ODE working with our association with COSA and um, OASBO, and they are actually taking the numbers that the economists predicted for mm -hmm. revenue from the income tax as well as lottery and the corporate investment tax, uh, corporate activities tax, and they um, determined what percentages could apply to each of those funding streams. And they came up with a $490 million cut to the state school fund. So we took that $490 million and determined what our percentage of that would be to get to the 1.324. Okay, so um, I guess so. How, I, I'm just trying to get a sense of how realistic that guidance is because I also it seems like I read something through OSBA or somewhere where it said, well, for right now, we were just going to pretend nothing had happened, which seemed kind of short sighted. But um, I, I guess I'm just trying to get a sense for where ODE and our other organizations are pointing us right now. Is the 4.7% cut their best knowledge right now, or is that just another exercise? 
No, I think that that's, this is Jen. I think that that is their, their best knowledge. I think the other piece of this is also, again, we're, um, we are, you know, still having those conversations of if it's going to be fully funded to the nine billion, which again, you know, that's part of that continued conversation, I think in a larger picture, but this has been uh, in at least the meeting since the last time we met, um, at really based off the 20th of the guidance that, um, you know, has been shared with both myself and Cease. Again, they still want us funding at the 9 billion. I think we're doing both. I think right now, because of the uh, situations that we're, we're in and still trying to work through some of these pieces, um, we have budgeted to the 9 billion, but we also, this cut sheet is, is realistic to potentially what we are hearing at this moment in time of, of you know, potential cuts that could come based off of the economic uh, forecast that was presented on the 20th. So I, I think, Don, these are realistic of what we know right now. Um, but again, I still think there's a, a lot of things ahead of us um, as we continue through these conversations and, and what, what, what will potentially move forward um, as those decisions are made and as we get more guidance, um, both from the Oregon Department of Education as from again, from CISA's lens with the business managers and obviously with our lenses with the superintendents. But this is, like I said, we wanted to start the conversation about what those cuts might actually look like um, if this were to truly come to fruition of what at least we know from the economic forecast on the 20th. So one last question along those lines, then I'll shut up. What, what is the process to get to that point? I mean, right now our guidance is to budget at the $9 billion, but we know that that's not likely to happen. Do we just wait? I mean, will they give us guidance before the 20, whatever it is, ninth or whatever, where we have to turn it in? Well, or... worse than that, we're going to ask you on the 8th, we're going to ask the budget committee to adopt a budget. And that's kind of what we need to talk about tonight quickly, since we're already kind of over time here. I talk too much. Um, hoping to get guidance about which, which budget items we want to prepare because in order to, to approve something to forward to the board for the 22nd, we, we need to take a stab at what numbers we want to use. Okay. Um, so that's, that's the general fund. Again, there's a little bit there I show from the Willamette ESD. That little bit uh, currently is used to create a contingency line uh, for a special ed IA, we get a lot of move-ins during the year of students who need one-on-one -on -one support. We don't staff up just in case. So we've put that money into a contingency um, and a reduction to the overall state school fund, reducing the amount we get from the ESD reduces the funding for that contingency. And then we just have to, uh, reprioritize everything when if one of those students comes in that needs that support. So that's the general fund. Um, the second page, I will not go into as much detail, but um, well, I've just frozen, I guess, if you move to the second page, that's why. Yep. I have moved to the second page. I, my, my screen just froze. Okay. Um, the High School Success Act, we were, um, it was suggested there that we had about a 35% cut to that. And um, <clears throat> that would reduce that fund by $295,000. Well, because a lot of the activities and professional development and things that we had planned for in this current year, the first year of the biennium, were not done, we anticipate having around $225,000 of carryover. And therefore, we will probably be able to carry on our high school success programming uh, with a reduction in purchased services that 
we, we had budgeted that and not spent it. So a slight reduction in those purchase services. And that was for if we needed professional development, speakers, things like that. Um, so we think the high school success budget will be able to carry out most of our programming without impact. And I, and I just want to be clear on this point, you know, again, part of this carryover is because of what we have been working through this spring and, you know, students not being in the high school. And so that savings is to some degree because of uh, what has taken place this, this spring. So again, I want to be clear because normally I, that cost would not, or that savings would probably not have been there should we have not been in the circumstance that we are this spring. So I want to be clear about that because I know that there could be questions brought forth. Again, we've we've had these unique situations. So to some degree for at least another year, we would potentially be close to being whole and continue our work there, which is uh, we're seeing some great impact um, with the work that they're doing at the high school. Yeah, as you can imagine, um, high school success is mostly about um, very personal touch support for students regarding career, college readiness, um, and attendance. <laughs> and so those high touch supports aren't in play right now. That's, that's kind of specifically what we call out there. So the student investment account, and again, this is new money. We had planned to move some things from the general fund. Uh, we actually have a position that has been funded for the last several years from a, a special grant called our trauma-informed grant. We had planned to move that to the student investment account. And we had um, a lovely list of things that we had hoped to do. Um, and they are telling us to plan for almost a 37% cut in that money. But we are concerned, frankly, that that is a one year, we, we are concerned about the future stability of that fund. Um, because it's new money, uh, because it is highly dependent on business and corporate activity, our, our concern about funding new initiatives or even planning to fund new initiatives um, makes us a little wary of that at this time. So what we would propose budgeting in the student investment account is listed here. Again, that $1.629 million for one year is down quite a bit from what we had uh, been allocated in early going. But we would bring over um, some hired staff, and these are all staff who are currently with us, our whole child coordinator, our elementary behavior specialists, our English language development specialist, and then a communications coordinator. These are all functions we currently have. In addition to that, uh, I mentioned we moved over the contracted mental health counselors from Polk County, um, but we also have ad had added a lot of programming and professional development in specialty areas. And I'll just let Jen briefly mention the acronyms there. When we're talking about professional development, um, really there's key areas that we're looking at. Obviously the first, and we'll continue to have the conversation of equity within the school district as there is a training tied around restorative practices, culturally responsive teaching, um, all fall into that area of equity. Uh, social emotional learning, that has been a, a really big focus, especially this spring, and we will continue that moving forward. Um, Multi-tiered systems of support, which is really um, how do we build uh, good systems, a foundational instruction, but at times there is also a need to intervene. And so uh, that's really building a good model and what that looks like. And then universal designed instruction, which is really uh, focused on engagement and how we continue to engage students in learning and pull out the learning from them. Those are uh, very large areas and some uh, work we have started and will continue to do uh, within the district. Um, and moving, um, you know, to be able to do part of that with the student investment account. 
um, moving forward. I think there's also, again, right underneath that, tied into that is we have uh, been working through and trying to build some ac academic intervention programming um, as part of that. And so again, wanting to be able to have those opportunities to um, purchase contracts or services to really support our staff, which in return is going to support the students within our school district uh, as we move move forward. And then the, and I'm just from a supply standpoint, yeah. I think it's been very different this spring. Um, and the list that's on the supplies and materials is not what we had initially had uh, proposed in our first uh, SIA. So we did. We just had them lower on the priority list. Fair. We'll see so, toilet paper on there. You mentioned yeah. toilet paper. <laughs> And, you know, we've had a good conversation about this the last few days because, again, um, it are, are, I'll be honest, when we look at that list and um, as we are concerned about the, will this continue moving forward? And we hope it will, but we also have to be realistic in our uh, processes and financial um, stability within the school district. So really have taken the, that approach of what do we need for the health and safety of students? Um, and so again, you see those um, listed in the supplies and material. I'm going to let Cease talk. I'm going to hand it back to her now uh, just a little bit about the HVAC and the uh, anti-microbial light. Microbial. Microbial. See, I'm still learning that myself about, you know, again, these are some one-time uh, funding uh, that we are really, we're lower down on the list, but have raised up since we've had uh, the spring happen. Yeah, thanks. That's exactly right. These were two items. When we thought of all of the things we could do to impact what we called the four buckets, the four buckets of the Student Investment Act, the number one bucket is actually in our district from our community was the health and safety of students. And two of these items uh, were on there as one-time expenses and they were pretty low on the priority list. but the uh, currently particularly at the high school our ability to control airflow is um, limited we have some older systems there and this particularly was an investment even though it's an investment in equipment or systems um, it we we put it in the student investment account because it really is about student health and it so happens that the work that we had talked about doing will would actually better support us as we talk about how we put students back into buildings, how we manage um, cross contamination, how we manage folks moving from parts of buildings into other parts of buildings. So we this is a potential use we would consider bringing back if we were to get the full amount that's showing there, the $1.629 million. Partly again, it's a one-time expense. Not knowing of the future of the funding for this, um, hiring folks, and we can certainly hire somebody for $125, $25,000, we just, wouldn't feel confident at this point that that position would be funded in the following biennium. Um, same thing with antimicrobial lights. These were um, an investment that would actually be put in our kitchen and we talked about our restrooms. They, they are typically uh, installed for food safety reasons and the light that is emitted actually is shown to reduce uh, microbes and bacteria in these high touch settings or in the kitchen where you have food. Um, they are not antiviral. <laughs> the only light uh, spectrum or something, and Jan Job will have to correct me on this, uh, that is could, could affect viruses is UV lighting. That's not safe for humans, so we are not installing UV lighting systems. Uh, the company that makes these antimicrobial lights has been very clear about saying that their product does not, uh, is not proven to have any effect on viruses, although they said some tests are being done um, in labs on that, but it really will increase 
overall, as we all know, getting rid of any kind of bacteria or any kind of um, health risks will improve the rest of us having a chance at dealing with whatever other kind of um, symptoms or syndromes come our way. So these, again, were one-time things. We had them pretty far down on the priority list, but it's something that could move up because it could improve um, our health and safety in our in our new facilities environment. But we have a whole list of other stuff. All of these um, expenses in the SIA were approved by the Department of Ed, and they knew that districts would need to have flexibility in moving things around. So um, if, if these weren't needed or uh, something else was needed or we found out this money could be counted on for future biennium, we could always go back and and hire some of those extra support folks we need. And the last thing on there, ESSER, is the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. That is money from the CARES Act, so it is federal money intended to, to um, help schools get through the damages or the losses that were incurred uh, in student learning because of the closure of schools. And our possible allocation, this, this money has not been received by the state of Oregon, therefore not fully allocated yet, is $744,000. The good news about that is uh, we could get some of it as early as the end of this month. We'll be able to access it. They, they are certain in July. It can actually be used through next summer. So uh, being able to have this money to beef up our summer school programming, our uh, summer bridge activities, which is moving kids from one sort of level to another is going to really, really help. It can be used for technology. It can be used for, for programming. So uh, that money is listed there where we are going to budget that without any sort of real sense yet of, of what that exact dollar amount is um, or how we will use it. Because we do have other sources of summer school funding. So we would do what's called blending and braiding, um, figuring out how to use different pots of money in a way that is true to the purpose of that funding. Uh, but the good news is this is something we'll get that can last us through two summers. So um, I was trying to get from Aurelia if we had any public comment and she had not responded to me yet if she had received anything. Why don't we, why don't we go to committee questions and then we can come back to public comments. Great. Does anybody have any questions or anything to say? I, I have one, Cease. So um, uh, I forget the exact number, but the, the total percentage of the cuts was four, four something percent. And that, um, that seems less than the uh, um, 8% or 17% that we, I heard coming out of the state. Is that because um, part of the money that the school district gets is based on property taxes and that's not expected to change? Is that why that's about half of what I expected to hear? Uh, well, the cut, this 8% or 17% would be just to the state school fund portion. And so, I mean, you're right that we do get property taxes and those are usually pretty, have, have a lot of equilibrium to them. So we don't see a lot of change there uh, because of the effects of the pandemic, but the actual state school fund portion originally that would have been the eight and a half or 17 percent after the economists came out and things look much better the the state hasn't made any changes to its predictions uh just because right now they're kind of waiting to see but since mm -hmm. the economic picture was actually better than what that 17 percent was based on I, I was surprised it was this much lower too frankly I, that that's that is sort of an um an enormously different picture, um, but it's also based on 
the individual streams of funding for state school fund. So part of that, even in the general fund, is the corporate activities tax. And that was not, did not change as much as, um, for example, the lottery funding or the income tax funding. So, and I can send you out all a, a I, I, we have, we got a, some slides about that and I can forward that to everybody to kind of look through and see how that's being calculated by our folks. Good, thank you, that would, that would be interesting. I will do that. Tom? I don't, I don't see any hands up. Is, so, uh, um, Tom Perry here in the room has a question, but he's not getting his microphone to work. So he's going to ask his question and we'll repeat it for you. Good, thanks. <laughs> Jared, Jared is coming over to bang on it and make it work. But. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you. Thanks, Jared, but you don't look okay, like your picture. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, I'm. This is maybe a redundant question, but um, In in my forty some year work in life, just a second, Tom. I don't think anybody can understand you at all because the audio you're putting out your microphone it is garbled and and slow. So hang on just a second. We'll see if we in can. In my fifty some year working life, go ahead. Keep going. We're good now. We got you in good sound. Okay. Um, in my 40 to 50 year working life, more like 55 years, um, when we talk, when I talk to a doctor, he'd say, well, you're either sick or you're well. Or if I go to the dentist, he'd say, well, your teeth are fine, you need a filling. But when you talk to an economist, you ask them how the economy is doing and they say, well, it depends. And that has been consistent for all those years. Um, my concern is that uh, there is a blooper in the system somewhere um, I appreciate the fact that the economists gave us the worst possible news first, but I'm surprised that they came back and said, well, it isn't as bad as all that. It's only a quarter as bad as it really was. So I am not going to necessarily place a great deal of faith in the numbers that they gave us um, for a while. Hopefully, hopefully we can get a confirmation by next week, but um, wait for the other shoe to drop. I'm just not confident those are good numbers. And I, and I, yeah, and I appreciate that. I think one of the things that we're going to continue to, to talk through is, you know, it's not only this year, but it's the future. And I think it's a combination of both. Um, and I appreciate that comment because we are having to work through that of where not only will we be this year, but where might we be uh, in the next two years as we move forward with that. So I think there's still a lot of conversations even through the next few months. I think as C says, you know, we need to, we're gonna need to adopt a, a budget and there may be other follow through that we will have to do as a school board and as a budget committee in the future. But um, these are based off of what we have uh, in those conversations, the, the best scenarios at this point that we feel comfortable uh, sharing with you all. Um, as we continue forward in this process. So I appreciate those because we have those same feelings uh, as well right now. Good, thanks. Is there anybody else that has any uh, comments or questions? Is, do we have anything from the public? Uh, did Aurelia uh, get anything from the public? There are no there were no comments. She put a text note in our Zoom, so she says at this point there were no comments. 
Okay, good. Um, well, I, um, we're a little bit over time, uh, actually quite a bit over time. Um, uh, thanks everybody for the presentation. I think that uh, sets us up nicely for the uh, June 8th meeting. So we'll reconvene uh, a week from today, uh, unless there's an objection to that. And hear hearing none, we will be scheduled for Monday, June 8th at uh, six o'clock p.m. And uh, this part of the budget committee meeting is, is uh, adjourned and I'll turn it over to uh, whoever's there to, <laughs> to start the school board meeting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, we'll just, uh, school board members, if we will take a quick uh, two minute break here, let the budget committee uh, exit out and then we will we will start our meeting. So uh, uh, for those of you out in the community, you may see our screens go uh, out of video for two minutes and then we will come back on. So please uh, hang with us as we uh, again, allow our uh, budget committee to, to uh, exit out and then we will start our June board meeting. So thank you.
just to, I'm going to do a quick review of Perfect. Looks like I have all of our board members. So um, again, I just want to uh, welcome everybody. So we're now shifting to our June board meeting um, and I'll uh, let hand it over to our uh, board chair, Steve Love uh, to start. And then he and I will uh, go back and forth here a little bit as we go through the board meeting. So great, thanks. Steve. Thanks, Jennifer. I'd like to go ahead and call the uh, Central School District Board of Directors meeting uh, to order. Uh, we'll start with actually the roll call. So I'll, this is also a, a bit of a mic check just to double check, make sure things are working. Uh, Jan Job. Present. Jerry Schinkel. Present. Don Wall. Present. <laughs> Present. Peggy Klein. Here. Darcy Kirk. Here. And Vidal Pena. Vidal, uh, there he Here. is. Okay. Confirmed. Here. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead then and do the flag salute. It might be best to have someone there in the room at. Uh, district office to lead the flag salute since that's where the flag is. Jan, would you mind doing that? I'm happy to. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under One God. One nation under God. Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. That was interesting. It was a little bit delayed. So I was trying to time my uh, pledge to what was coming actually across the computer. So I, th I think I did pretty well. We'll have to listen back to that. See if, it, if I think works. we shouldn't try to sing though. So audio quality is not great, but I think we will proceed. So um, turn it over to the superintendent for some opening comments uh, in light of some of the things that have been going on in our nation over the last week uh, before we go into the, the actual uh, agenda for tonight. So superintendent. So uh, thank you, uh, uh, board chair Love. And um, uh, I just wanted to take a moment uh, this this evening, uh, just to share a few thoughts. And um, so uh, obviously a lot has happened over the last uh, uh, few weeks. Uh, and so I just wanna share a little bit uh, as I think my role as a superintendent and that's how we continue to move forward. So my job as the superintendent is to build and support highly effective teachers and staff, highly effective principals, have quality family engagement, which we're learning and growing a lot in this distance learning, how do we have community uh, quality community involvement and partnerships, uh, good leadership teams and good uh, and great school district governance that supports lifelong learning and growing for students and their successes because that's our responsibility. Uh, this is a ama an amazing opportunity I have as an educator to serve and uh, all of this is and will always be grounded in equity. As I watched the past week uh, and continue to learn as an educator, and uh, this has been really close to my heart where uh, things are happening in Minnesota. I have a, a cousin who lives a block away and I have an aunt that is six blocks away. So uh, this hits very close for me um, in, uh, personally. So this last week, I continue to learn. As I said, I, my goal is to continue to learn as an educator. And I pulled up uh, my educational philosophy, a document that I sent to the board as I applied for this position as superintendent. And I wanna share a bit of this today. I believe children educated in an equitable and diverse community make significant impacts and differences in communities and the world today. I believe equitable teaching increases student learning, growth and achievement. I believe equitable leadership increases staff teaching and learning so students are learning, growing, and achieving. achievement is occurring. 
I believe it is important to elect quality individuals to govern the school district and stay in conversations and advocate for equitable and ethical policy decisions so every child can learn and grow and do this even when it gets hard, which we are continuing to do here in Central School District. We as a community must continue these conversations, work together, support one another, and stand together when injustice takes place. To all my friends and colleagues of color, I continue to stand with you, learn, and be in conversations as we work to unroot racism within our society. We must continue to care for one another, support from one another, and learn from one another, especially as our students in our community are our future. So again, I just wanted to share that as we started the, to the evening, and I'll give it back to you, uh, Chair Love, uh, to start our proceedings. So thank, thank you. And, it, and I actually remember reading your philosophy of education before we ever met you, and it, um, it stood out to me then, and it stands out to me now. So I really appreciate you reminding us of your beliefs and, and the leadership that you're giving our district and community right now. So uh, for the agenda, we will start tonight with the uh, communication from the floor. We uh, have a relatively short agenda. We'll go from there into our standing reports and uh, that'll be the superintendent finance and board report. Then we'll do consent agenda and we don't have any specific business agenda topics. We then will close with uh, comments from board members and then we will be adjourning into executive session. Uh, so that is the agenda for tonight's meeting. So with that, I'll turn it back over to the superintendent for our communication from the floor. Um, and yes. take it away. Yep, we have a, just a few questions that came from the community uh, this past weekend as we uh, again wanted to share up, make sure we're answering all questions. Uh, so the first question, I was hoping to do a district transfer for my son who is about to enroll in kindergarten based on his childcare location. Is there any extra uh, or is there anything extra I should do or do I need to reach out to uh, fill out any additional paperwork? So um, we are asking families if they would like to do an intra-district, intra so moving from one, inter one of our schools to another, to please go to our website uh, at central.k12.or.us. And if you click on the parent link at the top, um, right there, you're gonna see a, another link that says enrollment and transfer. And then once you're on that page at the, if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, you're gonna see a, a link to the intra-district form. Um, and that's the form that we are asking families to complete. Uh, we wanna be clear that um, decisions about intra-district transfers will, will not take place until August. There is a lot of moving parts still within the school district and what next year is going to look like. Uh, we need to see how summer goes as it relates to the COVID-19 virus, as well as guidance from the Oregon Department of Education and the Oregon Health Authority about opening uh, for the 2021 school year. And I'm going to share a little bit more in my report today about that, but there are still a lot of moving parts. We are asking families that if you do have an interest in doing an intra-district, uh, please do that. But please know that there are still moving parts uh, that we are having to work through as a school district. So that's the first question. Um, with the school year coming to a close, what is the process for returning Chromebooks? Uh, so the positive news is if you are going to be returning to our school district next year as a student in uh, any of our grade levels, uh, really first grade through 12th grade, uh, we are uh, allowing families to keep those Chromebooks over the summer. You're going to see our staff share some uh, packets this next week and as we end school. Uh, with different activities for families to allow their students to do over the summer. Uh, we're going to continue with some summer learning opportunities and we'll continue to uh, update our distance learning page with different activities that students can do uh, to continue their learning over the summer uh, if they would like. Um, if you are a family that may be transferring out of the Central School District, um, we will continue to post times. Um, at the district office over the summer for you to be able to return those Chromebooks. So if you are a returning student, uh, you get to keep those Chromebooks over the summer. We feel that's important to allow some of that learning to continue um, at your own pace with, with your family uh, or in the activities that we uh, are beginning to plan moving forward. 
Um, so the, uh, the th third question, what about high school registration for incoming uh, freshmen? Um, so what I sh found out today, especially specific to looking at freshman orientation, uh, there will be postcards coming out to all eighth grade students uh, really in the next couple of weeks from the high school to welcome all of you to ninth grade. Uh, so please look out for those to in your mail. Uh, there will also be additional communications uh, to begin to talk about the first week of August, uh, which really is that invitation to ninth grade orientation. So please know uh, the high school is in full force uh, talking about uh, the ceremonies that are happening this Friday. Uh, that's their focus, but please know that they're, they're already turning their attention to the incoming ninth graders and the returning students to uh, Central High School this next uh, year. So just be on the watch out for that. Um, I want to note that some of this orientation and connection could be virtually. Again, there's still some of those pieces that we're having to work through. Um, but again, we look forward to welcoming our, our incoming ninth graders uh, transferring into our high school. So we're excited about that. And then uh, last question, anything for our fifth grade uh, students? Do they, will they still be getting, you know, their awards and different things as they transition? Um, and contacting with the elementary school. Schools are working on their end of the year festivities. Uh, there's going, there's uh, one activity I'm just gonna keep quiet about because I want it to, I want everyone to enjoy it. So more to come. I don't normally do that, but this is a unique year. And so um, there's some cool things that are being planned right now. So I just wanna share that. And more, more of that will come out to the community here uh, in the next several days. Uh, several schools are also doing uh, some fifth grade videos to close out the year and that will be shared with students um, as well as several schools will be mailing those certificates home to students uh, to honor them. So uh, those are the questions from the community um, as we uh, received this weekend and wanted to make sure that those were answered um, as we move forward. And then we'll continue to put those in our FAQs uh, that are on the website uh, moving forward. So thank you community for, for getting those questions to us. We greatly appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And I should have mentioned this before we jumped into that, that the process that we're using again is because we're doing meetings virtually is we post the agenda on Fridays, if not sooner before the board meeting. And if any community members have comments, you can share those uh, at our email, uh, info at central.k12.or.us, or you can drop them off at the district office, and we'll make sure that those are addressed in our board meeting. So with that, we are now moving on to the standard reports. We'll begin with the superintendent's report, uh, which as we've been the last couple of months, we'll go into quite a bit of an update on how we're responding to the COVID-19 situation. Yes, and so it's learning. Perfect, thank you. So we're going to, I'm gonna look at my lovely technical assistance here to be able to uh, get our PowerPoint uh, going. Um, I just wanna share a few uh, areas that we're uh, continuing to uh, build upon and give us a second here. Um, so um, I'm going to start with, uh, there's, a, there's a, a lot of moving parts still. And I think one of the things that uh, I want to make clear is that um, we have staff working extremely hard uh, based off information that we have and are continuing to uh, build really good programs. I cannot say enough about our licensed staff and our classified staff and our staff in general of what they have built, implemented, and are really uh, getting students to learn and grow. I saw an amazing uh, Facebook post today from an MES parent uh, talking about Mrs. Kittleson's class and how much her son or her daughter, excuse me, is now outside uh, looking at different insects and bugs and how we've tried to continue to engage students in learning through this uh, new process. So again, that's just one example. Uh, of the different things that we're seeing our staff uh, be able to do to uh, embrace learning and allow students to continue learning in this different environment. So I'm gonna give a couple of updates, maybe. Let's see, my battery may have just died. Oh, there we go. So this first slide, um, 
I previously had previously shared about how we were going to account for participation or that really that contact and connection with students. Um, one of the things that I want to say is this is looking at three weeks of how we really uh, try to uh, capture when staff contacted students or had that ability. And when I mean contact, it was we had different uh, avenues to be able to do that, whether a student, student participated in a Zoom meeting, or whether they were in the Google Classroom doing work, whether there was an email communication back and forth with a teacher, or whether they're just the, the old old school, talk to them on the phone or had a, a conversation versus a remind app that we use within the school districts. So um, again, these are um, just our first look at those numbers. One of the things um, I'm going to note is that this has been very much a trial. And so we can, I can tell you right away that this was not as consistent of an implementation across the buildings as, as we um, will continue to talk through that if this is our environment next year. Um, I think this was a beta test for us on how this might look as we move, move forward. And we're, uh, again, I think want to be very clear about this since the beginning. We are trying to make uh, and meet families where they are. And that's not always always a diff, it's not always an easy thing because we uh, are trying to support families and the learning at the same time. Um, but again, if we are still in distance learning in the fall, we're going to need to find a consistent way to identify participation and learning in a digital platform. Uh, there are some successes here, um, and I think that's important. Um, again, first three week, weeks of, of our uh, distance learning, I want to point out uh, Central High School. It's, it is slightly skewed because the senior class is still in there. And um, with this data, we know that the engagement did drop off because as of March, uh, many of them were and had met their criteria for graduation requirements. So again, we know that that's a little skewed. I did a little bit of analyzing and I just, again, this is a starting point and I wanna be clear, this is just us trying to begin to say, how are we gonna do this if this could be our environment in the future? Um, so in, in analyzing this data overall, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays were our highest participation days, and Thursdays being our lowest particip our participation days. So again, I just use this as a starting point. I think it's, it's something that we'll build on. We learned a lot from our staff. We continue to learn a lot from our staff of how we capture this data um, in that contact and connection. So the second one, I'm going to take a minute to focus on our class of, of 2020. And um, what a year they've had. I think this Friday is going to be some amazing times for them, although very different than what we are used to here in uh, Central High School. Um, so Friday we are awarding, we are doing the awarding of the diplomas for seniors. Uh, this will be an all day event honoring cohort of seven students uh, every 20 minutes. Uh, that schedule is, uh, the ceremony is scheduled alphabetically to begin at 8.20 a.m and proceed with those seven groups of students and their two guests, and we end around 9 p.m. And then there will be a virtual turning of the tassel for the uh, class of 2020. Uh, we are encouraging all the guests who are chosen to attend their, with their senior for awarding of the diploma to live stream. And I wanna be clear because we wanna be able to live stream to social media, allow them to do FaceTime with other family members and friends or Skype with other family members because this is going to be an opportune time to be able to do that because we don't have the ability to have more than 24 people at a site um, within the school. Um, we'll be filming this entire day and there are different stages because we do have different sites within the school. So I'm not going to share uh, very much because we want to um, we're trying to build a really special moment for our senior class. And so I don't want to give too much away. I can tell you the staff, especially the graduation committee, has been working extremely hard to make it both safe and um, a moment for them as they uh, really take this end of this journey in their K-12 education. So um, we're looking forward to it uh, again. And then I will tell you that more information follow will follow about uh, the June 26th release of that virtual ceremony. So 
Um, board members, I know that I've asked you a few, a few things and I will be get, um, getting you the final uh, information to you on Wednesday of, of when I will need you and what your slot will be um, because again, your participation in, in this is also very important in this process. So the next slide I'm going to share is about the calendar. Um, so I just want to walk and I want to be clear that we do not at this time have a, there's no decision that has been made for a calendar within uh, the central school district for the 2021 school year. So let me start by that. However, um, we're starting to get information of what potentially school may look like. Uh, there's also been some concern of not having a start date. And so um, uh, we wanna make it clear that we have made a decision uh, that school will resume uh, for the 2021 school year to ease some of the anxieties uh, within our community uh, that we will begin school on September 2nd. What that looks like could be very different. So you're starting to see, and again, I, these are just examples. No decisions have been made about a calendar. There is work to still be done, not only with our community, but with our uh, both associations that are part of that process. Um, what I can tell you is uh, we're sort of starting to look at it being built in phases, again, similar to what has been uh, shared in our different counties as we've gone through this process. We have built phase one, which is the distance learning. So if this is a situation that we need to be in in the fall, uh, we know that we have that up and built. So that could be a potentially a phase one approach should we have another um, a hot spot of the virus um, or that, that um, potentially could allow us or cause us to stay in this phase one still. The other pieces that we're building are potentially what I'm calling phase or a phase two. And we're looking at what would be a, a hybrid calendar. So it could be a combination of both distance learning as well as um, in-person learning. Um, and so we've talked about what's called a low ratio. We know that the ratio of students to staff will be low. Uh, when we look at that in-person, that will look um, very different. And so we're in the midst of, of working on some of those protocols. It may also look as an A and B schedule. So A students may come on Mondays, then B students may come on Tuesdays. Um, we've also talked about doing a type of hybrid that every few weeks we stop and do a deep clean. Both of them throughout the day involve making sure the health and safety of our students and the buildings is, is a priority, but uh, that hybrid calendar could be uh, potentially a second phase. And then what I'm calling the third phase of approach would really be sort of back to that regular calendar, uh, similar to what we've done in previous years um, and potentially being full-time back into the building. So again, I just wanna show this, I wanna be clear with the community. Uh, we have not made a decision about the calendar. However, we have um, made some decisions about at least when the start date will be because we felt that that was important for to share with the community at this point. Uh, the next slide, two slides are specifically focused on the work we are doing uh, for our summer learning program. Uh, so we are in the midst of building this uh, program and want to just share some general guidance uh, from the Oregon Department of Education and where we are in our implementation process. Um, so we're looking at running a summer learning program that will either be five or six weeks in length, uh, going four days a week. Um, you will see here on this slide that the overall health and safety guidelines um, are directly from uh, the Oregon Department of Education. So these are the criteria uh, to potentially do um, both distance learning and in-person learning. So I wanna be clear, we are, we, this may be our beta test uh, to safely allow kids to be both from a distance learning and in-person learning 
uh, through our summer school process. Um, and we are being very diligent with this um, as we build this because the overall health and safety guidelines are what drive this uh, plan uh, specifically. So we uh, currently right now are in the midst of building all of these procedures that you see listed here. Um, and this uh, process involves our director of safety and security. It involves our nurses. It involves our teaching and learning. It involves our transportation and it involves our maintenance. So those departments are heavily involved uh, in the development of our implementation uh, amongst these different areas for the two, so we can make sure that we're meeting the overall health and safety guidelines. So um, again, just we wanna be very transparent about what the criteria is that we will have to do uh, to bring students back in. So we are going to continue to, like I said, we are in the midst of building these procedures and those will be shared with the community uh, for students that are part of our summer learning program. Um, uh, you're seeing, again, some, some repetitive things that we've done, obviously with our distance learning and addressing the mental health and how do we, uh, you know, continue to support students through both transportation and nutrition, uh, which is our, our, our feeding program that we have been uh, doing for multiple weeks. Uh, the next slide really uh, focuses on the who. Um, and so the slides uh, show who in the schools and the district will be prioritized for accessing summer learning. Um, again, I wanna be clear that our focus uh, for summer learning. And it, it really is, there's, there's really two focuses when you talk about access. Uh, one is for students, for example, a graduating senior that may be uh, credit short to be able to gain those credits as well as students that may be behind in grades nine through 11. So again, that credit retrieval process. And then programming for our K through 12 students um, really focused on migrant or students uh, without having access uh, because of, of internet, uh, potentially students with disabilities are emerging uh, bilinguals as well. So that's gonna be our focus of the access to summer school um, for who, who that will be. Uh, our, our focus of what the, the content will be, again, uh, really three solid areas. We're gonna continue to focus on the social emotional learning and then foundational academic skills, specifically both in literacy and math. Um, and so again, we're building that. And then as you look at the classroom uh, instruction, we are looking at building in person. And again, following those guidelines that I showed on the previous slide. Um, and we're looking at potentially building that in-person learning either one or two days a week for students. Um, but again, these are some of the items we're still working through as we build our protocols uh, for the process to enhance learning in this new environment. But I, I wanna be clear, this could be a really good opportunity for us to build some really good protocols um, and be able to bring students back into school safely um, so families feel that they, they can do that. So um, please know that we'll be reaching out to families um, and sharing information uh, should your uh, student potentially be one of those that we would like to have into our summer school uh, programming, summer learning programming. Oops, let me go back. Um, so the next slide is what I'm gonna say, the beginning framework uh, from the Oregon Department of Ed Education as we, we look at how we might open up for the uh, 2021 school year. Um, and again, I think one of the things that I wanna just show on the, the left side, I think that quote is really important right now. Um, I think we're moving in a positive direction in, in our community, but again, uh, I think we're still in this learning phase. So I, again, if you don't, we really aren't making the timeline, the virus is making the timeline, but we're going to plan uh, uh, and build as, as best we can in accordance with that. So um, you can see in, in the, uh, framework there, like I said, it's the beginning pieces of that, that we will be again, first and foremost, focused on public health and safety and what that looks like. Obviously we're in uh, already in those midst of leadership planning and what the operations of school will look like. Um, again, that care and connection. So the social, emotional and the mental health supports, which I, uh, as much as we talk about budget cuts, I think it's important that I am so glad that we put the mental health associates and that focus into our schools this year. 
um, and spent the and moved money to be able to do that because that's going to be a big part of that. And then uh, finally, fourth, the uh, continuity of the learning, because that's uh, really what our focus is. But um, this is this is going to change. And so I share this with you because these are the starting points. Um, we believe we will have guidance here, hopefully in the next week from the Oregon Department of Education on what this looks like. Um, but this is some of the information that they have shared with us to begin these processes. And again, uh, some of what we are seeing in the summer learning uh, protocols and procedures to put in place, uh, we believe that may be an extension of that of what that might look like for the school year. So again, I'm just starting to share the frameworks as we get information and we'll continue to share with the board and the public uh, uh, as we move move forward and i have i have a quick question this is adele sure um so when we're we're advising the the public and parents and students of of what phase we're looking at on your slide with the phase one two and three um are we gonna kind of meet them at each board meeting and say hey this is we were thinking we're going to be at this phase but we're still at this phase is that is it going to be like a monthly thing or is it literally yeah, we're, as we're, it comes? I think it's both. So, so what I'm happy about is we've built phase one. What we are building right now is phase two. I think phase three, we know how to be in and work in. Um, so uh, that's again, yeah. So, so we're in the midst of, of really building that, what that phase two would look like. Uh, like I said, we think we'll have, we are, have some really good people working on protocols to meet the requirements of the Oregon Department of Education. I am blessed to have the staff that I do and uh, Jason Clark and Brian Weatherly, who is our custodial maintenance manager sure. and just the work that they're doing. Um, so yeah, Vidala, it will be um, a month to month, depending on, again, uh, where the governor of the Oregon Health stand, where our, where our um, you know, where we're hopefully not seeing any more flare ups or spots of the virus, that, that will be part of our continued sharing uh, with the community on where we are. I will do very similarly in July, because if I feel that we know, hey, we believe we're going to be able to start school in phase two, we will be transparent with that. Um, but that may also not come till August. So I just wanna be clear with the community, there is still a lot of moving parts, um, but we are starting to build all of these and we'll continue to communicate out as we get those in place. Um, and again, I'm, I'm blessed and, and we have a lot of really good people working on this in our uh, school district. And then um, we'll continue to have partners um, uh, moving forward with that. All right, thank you. Yes. Uh, so the next piece is really what I'm going to also say is our, really our first look of how are we doing or how did families and students see. So the next few slides are just a snapshot of several of the questions we have asked our families uh, for feedback related to the distance learning for all. So I'm going to go through these. This is just a snapshot. This is not all the the questions, what we will do in July is go through this data again. Um, again, you can see from this, we have 150 responses. We know we want more than that. Uh, we've been working to uh, share out the survey. Um, I have reached out to a couple community members that have good community connections with different groups within our community and, and sharing this as well. So, and I wanna be clear, this data was taken as of last Thursday. Um, I know that there have been more, uh, people that have completed the survey, but I just want to sh just give you a quick glimpse of, of what we're seeing here. Um, so again, this, the survey still open can be found on our website on the front page uh, of the website. You can also find it on our Facebook page and it's also on the distance learning page on the district website. Uh, we're going to keep this open uh, through the end of the school, school year because we want as much feedback from families and uh, as we review our implementation, as we prepare for the 2021 school year, should we be in this environment moving forward? Uh, and as I said, the data that I'm about to show is from uh, as of 5-28-20. Uh, so this first slide shows just the uh, general feedback uh, by families from grade level. Um, so you can see uh, our largest group uh, that has shared with us so far is our K-3 families. Um, but we know that this data will, will continue uh, moving forward. Um, this uh, next question uh, is focused on how, really on our families feeling welcome in this new distance learning environment. 
because they are really partners with us now. Not that they weren't before, but they are truly uh, working side by side with us. Um, in this survey, the scale in the survey went from a one, which was a strongly disagree, to a two, which was a disagree, three was a neutral, um, didn't feel strong either way, to a four, which is an agree, and a five identified US strongly agreeing with this. So for this question of feeling welcome as partners in this process, uh, we see approximately 60% of our families agree that they felt welcome, uh, really putting a uh, question or four and five together. Uh, about 20% answered neutrally that we did okay, um, or maybe had some struggles with us, and then 17% that they did not feel welcome as the partners in this learning environment. So again, uh, just some good data for us to reflect on and how what that might look like in the future to how and to improve those pieces. Uh, the next one uh, focuses on uh, qu a question on how families felt their child was adapting to learning in this new environment. 37% uh, agreed their child was adopting fairly well. 27% uh, of them were neutral. Um, and about 36% disagreed their child was adapting and learning in this new environment. Um, and if I've never seen a perfect bell curve, this is pretty close um, to a perfect bell curve as you look at this. So uh, this doesn't surprise me at all. Um, I think that we have families that really enjoyed this environment. I think that we had families that did not join and enjoy this environment. So again, this, this as us trying to reach families as best we can, um, I think this data is probably about right in how our families are feeling in, in this new environment and how they adapted to it. So again, just some good starting conversations of how we, uh, if we are in this environment, how we continue to do that moving forward. Uh, the next question is focused on families' view of their child uh, adapting to the technology required for distance learning. 63% uh, agree their children uh, were fairly comfortable using the technology, 17% were neutral, and about 19% disagreed that their child uh, wasn't comfortable using the technology. So again, we'll continue to have these conversations, uh, potentially reaching out to families where maybe students jumped into uh, the learning and then maybe jumped out and how we might to help support them uh, to make sure that students are still engaged in the learning. So again, just another view of were, were students comfortable in the technology. The next one uh, focused on family routines that they built to help accomplish uh, the learning for students. Um, as I shared previously, we were um, in our, the earlier materials that we sent out to families. Uh, it was really important to us that we help families see that it was important to build the routines with their child as best they could, uh, knowing that these routines may look different uh, between families, but consistency of, of getting the routine of getting up, having breakfast, getting dressed, uh, and starting the day, doing some learning, uh, going to recess, playing outside, those types of things uh, could help in uh, building some consistency. So you'd see in the slide, 57% of the families responded that said that they had agreed that they had some good routines uh, within, their, within their family. 19% uh, were neutral. And then 24 responded that they didn't have good routines at home uh, to accomplish school and personal tasks. So uh, this slide really shows me how we, it's important of how we uh, reach the families and help them do this. I also know that that's not always easy. And so um, again, continuing to, to reach out to them and, and find ways of what we might be able to do to help in those scenarios. Um, the next slide uh, is focused on uh, uh, really the question, am I sharing, uh, really did kids enjoy the, does, do students enjoy the learning environment from your perspective as a parent? So again, you can see that my child enjoys this new environment. Uh, clearly, our students do not, or the families of our students do not. 54% of them disagree that their child and enjoyed the environment. 22% were neutral, and 24% agreed with their that their child enjoyed the new learning environment. So, you know, I take that 24% as there are students that did flourish in this, and so that's an important part for us to uh, make sure that we pay attention to as we move forward. But uh, it's clear that a lot of our families and students do prefer us to have them in our buildings, which we do as well. Um, so the next uh, set of slides 
is going to focus on uh, actually the student survey that we have going. And our student survey um, really focused on grade levels four through 12 for feedback related to distance learning for all. Uh, this was an optional survey for students to complete, but we did encourage uh, many of them to share their feelings and thoughts with us because we felt it was important. Uh, we will continue to gather feedback from students uh, until the year closes out next week. Um, and again, this data that I'm about to show you is what I have uh, pulled as of 5 28 20. Um, and then again, this first slide uh, does show the grade level responses so far. Um, and we do have some heavy responses in fourth and fifth grade as well as sixth through eighth grade. Um, I do think we'll get more ninth through 11th. I know that that uh, information was just shared this past week. So we know that that will continue uh, to get more information uh, within those areas. Uh, the next slide focused really on the connections with teachers that students felt they were connected. And you can see from here on this slide, 52% felt connected to their staff, 35% uh, were neutral and 13 didn't feel any connection with their, with their teacher. Um, and I, and I want to be clear, this was a different learning environment. So uh, this data of uh, students feeling neutral that they weren't sure how they felt. That doesn't surprise me at all that our students are saying that. I think this has been learning on how to do that for students as much as our staff. Um, so some of that data is, in, in my, my opinion, for what we're having to be in and which is very different than our normal learning environments. Um, that's, I expected this data uh, to look a little bit this way because I think kids are learning how to do this uh, in this environment. Uh, the next uh, question is really uh, focused on engagement and comfortability in the new learning platforms, such as the Google Meets, the Google Classrooms, and how they correspond uh, with the students or with our, how our teachers correspond with uh, students via uh, email, phone, or the app. Uh, you could see that 63% of our students felt comfortable in the platform, 24% uh, were neutral, and 13% weren't really comfortable uh, in that learning platform. So good to know that that from a technology end, it looked very similar to what the parents also said of that comfortability uh, with technology. Uh, the next question, I think this is a really important question. This is focused on what we call in the educational world differentiated instruction that students uh, felt teachers tried different ways of teaching to help them learn. Um, so again, 60% of the students felt teachers did teach in a different way to pull out their learning. Uh, 22 were neutral, so may have had a little bit of that, may not have. Um, and then 11% of the students did not feel that, that teachers differentiated their instruction. So uh, again, for us, this being our first learning environment in this new platform, um, I was pleasantly, I, I was very pleased with this data. Uh, this shows great work by our staff trying to reach out uh, to our students in different ways and meet them where they're at and help them learn. So um, I, I really think that's important to point that out. We Don't get me wrong, we have growth in that area, but I think it's for this new platform, uh, that's, that's some successes uh, for us as our teaching staff. So uh, kudos to our teaching staff. Um, the next uh, slide focuses on, again, asking the students how, uh, what the family involvement was to support their learning. 58% uh, felt they had good family support. Um, within this environment, 19% were neutral. Um, and then 23% of students did not feel their family environment supported their work, their schoolwork and learning. So again, that's one of those uh, areas we'll continue to monitor uh, as we, we look at this data. And then um, one of probably the uh, most intriguing and the data that to some degree I have concerns um, about is uh, the question that we asked if students are able to have strategies uh, really to self-regulate or calm themselves down when they were feeling stressed or upset. Um, and this really ties into our work that we're, we're really focusing on the social emotional learning. Uh, one of those key domains is self-regulation and how can you, uh, do you have strategies to help your uh, self when you are feeling stressed or upset? 
Um, so 56% of our students that took the survey so far agree that they have a strategy to calm themselves down. 24 were neutral. So they may have a strategy or two, or they may not have a strategy to use. And then 19% say that they did not have a strategy to help support uh, when they're feeling stressed or uh, upset. So I, I, that neutral and uh, disagreement to not having the strategy is something that we are paying very close attention to, um, especially if we are in this environment or as we help kids transition in between both those environments. So um, again, a little bit more information will we'll continue to monitor, monitor these pieces. Um, and then the last two slides um, really are were open-ended questions that we want we asked the students. Um, and I just wanted to give you a snapshot of some of the impact that uh, this has had with our students. So the first question we asked them was, how has your life changed or has your family been impacted by uh, this pandemic? Um, and so again, I just take give you a minute to look at those. I think it's really important. Uh, you all know how important student voice is. Uh, to me as well as staff voice and as well as community voice. And um, you can see some of the feelings of our students up on the screen. Um, I think a couple of them that's uh, the third bullet down is yes, things have changed. I feel more alone. And I think that that was a, a statement that was repeated multiple times um, from different students. Um, I think the bottom one, it makes me mad. I think. Uh, students are going through a lot of different emotions. So again, just trying to capture what, what uh, students are feeling so we can help make good decisions moving forward. And then the last uh, second question is really, we tried to say what, what's been positive or the changes in your life that, have, that you, uh, has helped you and or are allowing you to get through this. And so again, um, you know, some of these are focused on schoolwork, uh, going at their own pace. Um, and then they can get their stuff done. Uh, I love the second one to be a little bit more responsible, I think, right? That just that self-reflection uh, as a student, because you probably have a little bit more responsibility depending on uh, your situation and, and where, where your family is as we are trying to meet everybody where they're at. Um, so again, we just wanted to, to share uh, this with everybody um, in regards to just some beginning uh, information. The last slide I'm going to, to share with you is um, we're continuing to, um, obviously our student surveys are in progress. Our family surveys are still in progress. We are about to launch here um, this week, our staff survey. So we're just doing our final edits to that. Um, we are going to continue our summer learning program and more information will come out uh, in the next few weeks, really in the next two weeks as we build this. Uh, and then we will, uh, we are continuing our conversations and plannings uh, as we prepare for the fall of uh, 2021 school year. So with that, I will open up uh, the floor. Uh, if Jared, you want to change us back to, to just questions uh, from the board and anything that I have shared this evening. Jen, do you have a target date for when we would have a decision on what the kind of operating mode is going to be come September 2nd? So our, we are hearing that, and hopefully this Thursday we'll get a little bit more of a secure date. Uh, we are hearing that guidance for the 2021 school year will be out the week of June 8th. Once we have that in our hand, we have already um, designated several days with our administrative team across the district to begin some of those planning. I think some of the things that we are building right now in the summer school um, learning environment may continue to shift um, and be part of that uh, fall 2020. I would like to say by August board meeting, we would have a clear picture of this is what school will look like. That's my goal. Um, but I, as I say that, being transparent, a lot of this depends on the virus continuing to be in a really good space where the opening up, people are being uh, smart in their um, choices of as they're out in public and the continued physical distancing, because that is very clear in the guidance that we're getting that that is helping. Um, 
you know, the, the cleaning of the schools will be part of that process. Um, so really, th that's my goal is that August board meeting that I will be able to present maybe sooner than that. But realistically, I think that um, being transparent with the community and you all, I think that my goal is to by that August meeting, we have a majority of of our pieces in place to to be able to share out. Now, I also say that that we could get into July and if things shift, we would then have to pivot back to what I'm going to call is that phase one into that distance learning and then figure out what that might look like. Um, I also want to be clear that, um, and I hope I'm wrong as I say this, that I think that we may have to be flexible of being able to go in and out of phases um, where we may have a month where we may be in distance learning and then the next month could be a mix of the hybrid. So. Um, I think there's a lot of work ahead with my team. Uh, and when I say my team that in involves our union leadership, they're very much at the table and will continue to be at the table. Um, we continue to gather feedback from our community and we will continue to do that. Um, uh, but there are gonna have to be some big steps. Uh, again, we feel with uh, what we're building with the summer learning, um, a smaller group of students that we're um, wanting to um, really bring in because they have had some learning loss more than others. Uh, we know all students have had learning losses, but those that have not had internet connection, which is about 10% of our students, uh, we need to do some targeted focus and, and a handful of other students uh, in that capacity. We believe that this model could give us some um, learning, um, doing it in the safest way. Uh, right now, I know all day today, uh, Jason Clark and Angela Billman, who is our one of our nurses, uh, are working side by side building that those protocols to make sure things are safe in the building. So that's my goal, Steve. Um, <laughs> but as I shared with you guys, I think that we still have a lot of moving things um, as we move forward. So, um, Jen, you kind of just touched on this a little bit. Um, in terms of the health and safety protocols, how can you kind of characterize how much of that we have to do as a district and how much ODE is just going to hand us and say you need to do this? Uh, I think it's going to be a, I think it's going to be a combination of of that. I think that we um, so the 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 bonus of having and running emergency car, uh, child care in partnership with the YMCA um, is we actually got to see some really good quality protocols put into place. Um, we are in the midst of looking at those and building upon those and what that will look like. I think there will be some good examples of forms and procedures to, to use. Uh, like I said, we've, we have one version uh, that we've been able to watch as we've been partnering with the YMCA. Um, I think both uh, Jason Clark and Angela Billman uh, really have been tasked to uh, you know, work with the Oregon Health Authority and what they're sharing with the CDC and trying to build those. So I think it's gonna be a combination. Um, you know, really, we've had conversations uh, even of how kids will wash their hands. Um, and so just some, some uh, different conversations that I never would expect us to have, but are probably the most crucial conversations that we need to have right now uh, to make sure that we have safe environments as we move into this. Um, what I'm calling phase two of a potential hybrid approach uh, to potentially start the fall. Thanks. Jen, I was going to ask you about the uh, slides that you were showing. A lot of them had, um, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, a lot of them have, of course, you know, the questions in English and in Spanish. Do you know or have data as to how many households that answered the survey questions were from our are Spanish-speaking families versus uh, how many were from uh, the rest of the community? So Vidal, we did not on this survey. We had that conversation. Um, I can tell you um, because I wanted to uh, get uh, making sure that all parts of our community are represented. Um, I had the opportunity uh, two weeks ago to sit on a community chat with independents. 
Um, and so there, uh, Ramon, who's our, their community coordinator, he and I are working in partnership uh, to try and continue to share out with uh, all of our families, uh, specifically our Latin AOX families to make sure that they're completing the survey because that's a really important part of that. Uh, we, we will probably moving forward as we uh, do our surveys, um, ask more demographic uh, convert or demographic questions. But um, at this point, we want to uh, families to feel safe and and just be able to answer uh, really a handful of questions of how really have things gone. But please know that that I'm doing uh, multiple outreaches and multiple uh, with multiple community members to try and reach all of our families uh, moving forward. So uh, know that we talked about that, but we just wanted it to be more of uh, hey, we just want to get a general feeling of how uh, you felt. Sometimes uh, families feel. Um, willing to share more when it is more anonymous and right now we wanted to just have, have quality data um, but know that that is a, a topic of our conversation as we think about a larger culture and climate survey uh, that i wanted that you know as part of our strategic plan and that we build that that would be part of those questions so we can be able to decipher that data a little bit more um, to make sure that we are uh, really reaching all of our families and our students in in a most equitable way cool my my next question is you were you were uh talking about the students that didn't have internet um, capabilities. And it got me thinking about the, uh, the hot spots that we had, whether it was at the school or, or other spots. Um, do we have any data as far as, as how, much, uh, how much we were able to help the community with that? You know, maybe a, a per day visits from students or, or is there a, a, from each router or hotspot, is there a data that was collected from there that this was accessed by this IP address for this long or anything like that? I, yes, I know they have it. I have not had it. Again, that's been uh, one of those that will continue to um, gather. I don't have that data right now, Vidal, but I will follow up with my, our tech subcommittee to see if we do have that data. Um, I know one of the things that we're working on right now, the hot spots right now are at the schools. Um, like I said, we finally, I believe we finally have the equipment that we need to do what's called access points. So we will use our internal internet in the schools to attach what's called an access point, And then we will be able to move those buses or those devices that are the Wi-Fi mobile hotspots to other parts of town over the summer. So know that that is one of our next steps. Uh, as we continue to do this, I have shared with the board um, some of my, and, I, and as I say this, I have an amazing tech team who is doing amazing work, yet it has been very frustrating on the internet side. Um, and as C shared earlier in our budget meeting, you know, some of this is, is really looking at what do we need to do to continue to build that infrastructure. Um, because in rural areas, even though we are not that far from Salem, um, we know that there's a lot of strain on the system, especially the internet system. And so how do we keep uh, bolstering that uh, moving moving forward? So I will ask that question, Vidal, and get that to the board. I'll, I'll put that in a Friday the Friday report as I get that information uh, from the tech team. Thank you. Yep. Any okay, other questions? Hey, thank you, Superintendent. Let's go ahead and move on then to the uh, finance update. Uh, so I'll turn it over to uh, Cease. You ready? Hey, yeah, I sure am. Um, attached or emailed to you today um, and attached in the link to the agenda were just two financial reports. Um, again, typically don't get them both at the same time, but I'm just really trying to keep everything up to the minute and will not go over them in detail. Um, highlighted a couple of spots where you can see that we are making these huge investments in distance learning, one of them being our print shop, uh, pretty busy folks these days trying to uh, keep up with printing packets and getting materials out to families in a variety of ways so that they can access them and the others with our hardware and software. Um, the needs are going to continue to increase in that area. So that's another thing we're looking at as we plan to budget for next year. But uh, that was the 
actual budget to actual. Uh, the other thing is the appropriations report. And the thing that I noted there is that um, our food service fund looks like it's overspent. It actually, again, between encumbrances and expenses, it shows as more out than appropriated, but because some of that's encumbrances, we haven't spent that yet. Um, however, that said, food service has had to completely change their model of doing business these last few months of the school year. And um, in some ways that's more expensive. We've had to switch to more pre-packaged food uh, because a lot of the food that keeps our costs low during the year are actually commodities, are actually um, from cheese and from a, a variety of different types of foods that we get, fresh fruits, vegetables, canned frozen foods and vegetables, um, that those commodities are actually subsidized by the federal government for a lot of them and we go through a bidding process to get them but really all we pay is storage and shipping on them so um, we are not able to use those in our grab and go meals and instead creating these grab and go breakfasts grab and grow lunches we are using a lot more uh, different kinds of foods that aren't available to us at those kinds of subsidies. So we are keeping an eye on that. That could be one that we have to come back to you at the June 22nd budget, our board meeting. After we have our budget hearing, there will be a board meeting. Um, and at that, we may have some of these final budget transfers for you. But that may be one where the pandemic has kind of stuck us and we may have to uh, ask to appropriate some more money for the end of the year spending. Other than that, things are looking good. Okay, thank you Cease. Any questions for Cease? Okay, we'll move on to the board report. Uh, as you see in your agenda, the upcoming meetings that we have, um, you know, note that we're our next board meeting, regular board meeting, it's the 6th of July, so it'll be right after the 4th of July weekend. We have our budget and board retreat meeting on the 22nd. Uh, we also have a budget meeting next Monday, June 8th. Um, so next Monday, we'll be meeting at 6 o'clock. Is that correct? Okay, and we'll be doing this again. Okay. And then on the 22nd, um, remind me of the, the time frame that we're thinking of on the 22nd. So um, we have had the, because of the uh, opening up a little bit uh, with the phase one, and obviously we are able to have a space here in Hawk Hall. Um, I think one of the, the questions we can have is normally in June, we do a retreat, obviously myself with the board of directors um, and I may have some uh, more guidance and may have some uh, questions. So that was uh, looking at a really an afternoon meeting of a couple hours heading into the to the board um, hearing for if we needed it then, which we believe we will. <laughs> uh, that we would um, you know do a few hours before that. Um, it may potentially be having conversation with the principals and some of the things that we're building, um, potentially even bringing in union, union leadership as we have these conversations on what the school year might look like to give you guys a little bit more information, but then move into that. So that's really what that is. I think we can um, continue to talk through that. I think we can do it safely. I did it safely with uh, 17 of my administrators this past week as we started to talk about what next year and how the end of the school year would happen. Um, I, we did it in a very safe way. Um, again, tonight here we have uh, six of us in the room. So um, it is really up to the board how we want to either convene in person uh, and or we can still do it virtually. So um, that's really the discussion we need to potentially have for the 22nd of what that might look like. 
Okay. I, I think it's out on the calendar from one to eight. So keep that in mind. If we don't need all that time, give us an update here. In Absolutely. A week or so. Yep. A uh, couple of other updates. I think just today, OSBA uh, came out with an announcement that the summer conference is going to be done virtually. Uh, so that actually might be a good thing. I mean, I, I think they're putting a lot of time and energy into to planning that. They've got some good speakers lined up. In some ways, it's easier to participate since uh, you know you can do it from home. So pay attention to that and sign up and see if you can get in there and participate. The other thing from an OSBA standpoint is I was able to join a call last Wednesday evening with uh, our, our regional uh, chairs from our region. So we had representatives from McMinnville, Newburgh, Dallas, and then ourselves. And this came about because Brandy Penner from Newburgh, who is our representative from our zone, had asked about a month ago if um, we needed any help with our virtual meetings, if we had any questions. I told her at the time that we were doing pretty well, but suggested that, you know, with, with so much going on and so much of a budget challenge, this was a month ago, uh, we ought to think about getting together to see how each other is just beginning to respond to the budget challenges or to, you know, COVID-19 in general. So it was a good discussion. Jim Green joined. Uh, we talked for just an hour. Um, some of the key takeaways I had heard during that meeting, you know, some of the, Jim was able to explain some of the budget guidance, which we've heard tonight was all consistent with uh, what we had discussed in our budget meeting earlier tonight. Um, Dallas reported that they had approved their budget based upon kind of current course and speed, noting that, you know, we don't know until later this summer what we're actually gonna do. So very similar to what we had been discussing in our budget committees. Um, some of the interesting things were, you know, the, the flexibility that we're going to need um, from kind of everybody as we get close to, you know, restarting in the fall. Um, it's really only 90 days out, and we also need to give our staff a break and make sure that staff is, is able to recharge. Um, and so something we just need to keep our eye on is there's a lot of planning work that's going to be going on. And uh, we got to take care of ourselves and we're going to have to, um, you know, work with our, our union leadership and, and really talk about flexibility and what we can do. Because you just start talking about these hybrid solutions. Um, well, some of that was discussed in that meeting, cohorts or, you know, rotating schedules as that as, as we you know, determine what we're going to do. It's a very unusual staffing situation, and you know every district, um, you know that was represented was talking about just how challenging that that's going to be. Uh, and it's very likely, I think everybody, the consensus was it's going to have to be a hybrid model because uh, I don't, you, you can't assume that that every family is going to be willing to say, yeah, I feel great, let's send kids back into schools or vice versa, whether our staff would be willing to do it. So there's gonna be a lot of questions still come, come the fall that I think will, you know, again, this was kind of the consensus is, is do some phased restart, similar to what Jennifer was saying about doing, using the summer school and doing some type of a phasing hybrid model in the fall until, until we can work back towards, you know, getting, getting back to normal. Consensus was always, we need the kids back as soon as we can get them, um, the, there is you know no doubt that we're having impact socially and you know from a learning standpoint, I think we're doing a very good job, as good a job as every other district is doing, if not better. Uh, but uh, as you you know, I think uh, everybody understands that we need the contact with the kids and we need the kids in contact with each other. Um, one of the things we talked about is just whatever the hybrid you know nuances are within each district how important it is to get the community conversation community input surveying and surveying you know specifically in, in a, an ongoing dialogue as we go through the summer months and every district is going to be challenged to do that and it's really really important so all the legwork we've done in the strategic plan and now the surveying is super super important and and you know, I think we're well positioned but we, we can't underestimate how important that community connection is. 
Uh, and then last- Hey, Steve, can I add something to that? I yeah, think that yeah. that's a very valid point. And what I would ask our community is, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, summer gets over and, you know, kids need a break and different things. This has been such a unique uh, spring um, that I do want to say families, please, please continue to stay connected. Please continue to watch our website. Please follow us on, on Facebook and uh, because we are, this is going to be summers where we may be sending out surveys. Uh, you may hear my voice every week still in communication um, as we are making uh, decisions uh, moving forward. So I, again, I want to articulate that as well as a superintendent is that it's very important as a community, you stay connected to us over the summer uh, because we are going to need you um, as we start to make decisions and really get some uh, quick data points of, hey, we're thinking about this. How would you feel? Here's this protocol. How would you feel? Um, because I think some of that is going to be very important for us to open up successfully of whatever that looks like in the fall. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Uh, Jim, uh, again, the uh, president of OSBA was commenting that we're lobbying hard through OSBA and I think COSA as well to get the state to do centralized purchasing of PPE so that our districts are not competing against one another. So I asked him point blank, you know, how likely do you think that is that we could actually get the state to, to do that? He, what, he didn't answer me directly, <laughs> but, but it's a really good idea. I think it would be really helpful. And Don, that kind of gets to, to one of your questions, although that was more about, you know, uh, being efficient in order to, you know, get, get the equipment and supplies that we're gonna need. And, and Steve, I want to say, because we know that there's some additional money that might be coming as, as C shared at the bottom of that budget uh, document, um, we are starting to purchase some of those. So as an example, we have bought, I think it's 40, how many thermometers? Uh, we have 30, 30, 30 excuse me, 37, uh, th you know, thermometers to check. Um, so we're, we're starting to know that we're going to need certain things in, in, in all of the schools and are starting to look at that. PPE is one of those big conversations between CIS and I and uh, Brian, who's our head of custodial and as well as Julie Hammond, who oversees student services. We know that that's a big part of that. So I appreciate that advocacy at, at a board level because uh, we'll need to continue to have those conversations. Um, this will be unique equipment that we have never had to purchase before. Um, and we want to make sure that we're doing it and having it and uh, being able to do it in the most safe way. Yeah. And there, there's a question about PPE. Of course, we're talking about personal protective equipment. Um, we're talking about face coverings. We are talking about gloves. We actually are pr procuring some face shields. Um, if you're in super close contact with students, um, some of whom aren't able to uh, manage to be able to keep um, from tearing masks away or things like that. So we, we are procuring a lot of the different personal protective equipment styles. Uh, last couple of comments, you know, uh, going back to the virtual conference this summer, I would imagine that there will be quite a bit of discussion at the conference this year about this situation and what different districts are doing to respond. So that's another reason, uh, you know, if you can participate in any of those sessions, especially probably this year, you know how they always do breakout sessions. I think those are going to be really, really interesting. Uh, and in fact, I made the comment to, to Brandy that it was, you know, it's interesting that we were able to do this zone meeting of board chairs with Jim. He was gracious enough to give us an hour of his time. And uh, it was great. I mean, we were able to just talk and, you know, see each other. It was in Zoom and we, we'd never done that before uh, other than seeing each other occasionally at the conferences. It was actually a really, really good meeting to get to know each other a little bit more and just know that we're all in this together. Uh, and Jim was, you know, as he usually is, just great and just a, a wealth of information and, and insights. So um, we talked actually quite a bit about our respective kids that are in high school and how hard this is in our high school kids. It's hard on everybody, but this, the social impact on our seniors, our juniors, it's, it's really significant. I'm maybe speaking a little bit personally now, but, um, you know, we were all comparing notes because as board members, you're typically going to have older kids in high school and that's what we were realizing and just realizing how hard it is on our our kiddos that are at that age so it was a really really good hour spent in it and uh 
you know, again, I think we're on the right track, but I think we've got our work cut out trying to get, you know, to a plan for not only the summer, but for the fall. So important that we prioritize our retreat and pri prioritize our conference and, you know, try to stay up with the reading that, and all the material that's coming our way through OSVA. And I know we're getting a flood of it, but, but, but important to try to keep up with all that. Okay, any questions for me on the board report? Okay, that brings us then to our consent agenda. We have the typical consent agenda uh, with our meeting minutes from last month and personal personnel recommendations. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I so move. Thanks, Fidal. Do I have, have a second? Jerry just seconded. I'll, I'll second. Oh, okay. Thank you, Jerry. So we have a motion to approve the consent agenda. Um, all in favor say aye. I'll go through and do a roll call. Jan? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Don? Aye. Peggy? Aye. Darcy? Aye. Vidal? Aye. And I am an I, so the consent agenda is approved. Uh, as I mentioned at the onset, we do not have any business agenda topics. Um, we will be adjourning here in a moment going into executive session, but before we do, we have an opportunity if anybody from the board would like to share additional comments, now is the time. Uh, I, I had a, a comment, I think I'm, I'm, I'm talking with Shannon, core about um, about involving the, the district with um, the 4th of July festivities that are uh, being planned right now by the Independence Planning Commission or Independence States Commission which I'm a part of as well and um, what we've narrowed down are our five uh, separate parade routes starting at the same time and uh, focusing on businesses to uh, feature or cart our seniors around. I, I, I mentioned it earlier to Jen and she had not heard about it yet. And then I finally got a hold of somebody on the commission. And, um, and I, I, I think I'm on a table that now that I think about it. So Shannon speaks with C. I think C. she might be talking to you. And Vidal, after I and Vidal, after I talked to you, I actually uh, about an hour later had information that I actually have a meeting for that tomorrow. So oh, it had not been on my calendar, and then it appeared. So uh, we are. I don't know. That we again, we don't know the extent of everything, but we will yeah. definitely be learning more about tomorrow and and what that might look like in, oh, in support of our seniors and how we might be uh, partners as we go through this uh, process of whatever the Fourth of July is going to look like. So. Yep, okay. it is It is on our calendars now. Perfect, well, I'm glad you brought it up so I can know now. Thanks at all, uh, anybody else? Just <clears throat> since we're doing stuff on a personal note here, I just got the key to a two and a half million dollar playroom for a uh, <laughs> high school and middle school students. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we're still working hard to try and figure out how we're gonna use it. <laughs> and so um, as, as we move forward, we'll be, you know, reading the same stuff that the district uh, staff is reading to keep, you know, develop the health and safety stuff and everything. But uh, it will be a good place to have either a cohort of 10 or maybe a group of 25 or whatever we're able to do. And, uh, and we're doing the same thing, trying to figure out where we can order thermometers and PPE from and all that sort of stuff. So, um, but we're we're going to be doing something here in the next few weeks, and hope to hopefully maybe we can do something uh, along with the um, uh, summer school program uh, to have some things for kids to do over the summer a little bit. So that's that's what we're working on. Thank that's you. Awesome. Um, that, and congratulations to you and the whole team that's been a part of the gate for so many years. It is what a, a remarkable achievement. It's just beautiful. So proud of that facility. It's just amazing what you all have done. So really, really appreciate it. 
we, we are making plans to let you see the inside of it before too long. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait. You know, um, that reminds me, one of the other things we talked about in the call last week with the OSBA zone uh, was how do we care for the kids? If we are in a hybrid model, we have kids that are not going to be in school every day. And we've got parents that are hopefully going back to work. So, well, I mean, it's just, I know it's on everybody's radar screen, but community partnerships um, are going to be so critical as we restart in the fall. And, you know, it's just one more complexity, but fortunately we have the partnership with the gate or we have the partnership with the Y. Um, we have the new facility down on sixth street. So we have, we do have, some options probably and more advantages in a lot of communities so but but i think you know for the board again we may play a more vital role in, in working on some of those connections come this fall than or later this summer than normal so um again we're, we we need to be helping wherever we can uh so anybody else want to share a thought before we adjourn i have one real quick can you hear me Yes, we can. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I've just, I've had some really great um, feedback from teachers and then from, with regards to my kids in terms of the communication back and forth um, and that teachers have showed a whole lot of grace with homework. Um, don't understand this. Can you help me figure this out back and forth? And then just, you know, take three more days to figure it out. So you get it done completely and you're not stressed out. Just take the extra time to do it. And they've just been super flexible. And I've heard that from other high school students as well. And I think it's just, it's so amazing that like that space has been like a safe space to say, I totally don't understand. Like I need to talk to someone or what have you. And then they allow for that time and grace. It's just been awesome. And then today, I got a chance to adopt two seniors through a national adopt a senior program that actually was seen by my sister in Washington. And I adopted two of them. And today I delivered baskets to both of them and some stuff for college. And it was amazing. They were so excited and they brought out their caps that they had decorated and they showed those to me and we took pictures. It was really, really cool to be a part of that, like in our community. So it was awesome. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Darcy, for sharing that. Both those. That's, that's awesome. Anybody else? All right. Given that uh, we are going to adjourn into executive session under the provision of ORS 192.660 open meeting law, the board of directors will enter executive session for the following purpose to conduct deliberations with persons designated to carry on labor negotiations, which is a part of ORS 192.6602 D, which happens to be one of the executive sessions where um, it is private, no, no press allowed or uh, participate in this particular meeting. So specific information discussed in an executive session shall not be made public and shall remain undisclosed. Again, that's because we're in labor negotiations. Uh, the board may return to open meeting to take an action on executive session discussion if needed. I don't think that's expected tonight. Um, so at this point, I will adjourn us. Uh, we are now adjourned.